Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert Sean Stevenson here with my amazing, talented co-host and producer, <laughs> producer of the Model Health Show, who's flexing. <laughs> She's got that flexibility. Right, it's her ability to, to flex. Feel some muscle in there, Jade. lifting. Jade Harrell, the one and only Jade Harrell. How you doing today, Jade? Fantastic. I am gratinormous today. Gratinormous. What is yes, that? Yes, enormously, enormously grateful and filled with gratitude today. Ooh, yes, I like that. Gratinormous. That 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 rushed over me like a warm like a warm bath. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so awesome. So glad to hear that. Everybody, thank yeah. you so much for tuning into the show today. We've got something mm-hmm. special for you, just for you. That's how we do. Very very powerful and. We've actually mentioned this work several times on this show and talking about telomeres, Uh, you know, and we'll dive in and break down what that is for those who don't know right now. But that science was really brought forth. um, Elizabeth Blackburn, Mm -hmm. Nobel Prize winner, all that good stuff. And I knew about this, I think it's maybe 2010. I I found out about this and I started telling people about this. Like, you have to Mm -hmm. understand, like we found possibly something that can really we can look at biologically and know how long we're going to live yeah. or how long our health span will be not just how long we'll live but how long we'll live good yeah yeah you know and it was incredibly exciting and she actually partnered with this amazing <laughs> amazing scientist and a fellow doctor uh, in another field who really brought forth and just listening to her and ris- and 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 hearing her research in mm-hmm. this book and seeing so many things we talk about on the show how it is clinically proven now to impact your health in a very, very deep, intimate way. Uh, so today, today's is going to be yes. totally mind blowing. It's about our longevity potential. Yes, indeed. <laughs> but before we do that, really quickly, yeah. I want to give a shout out to look. Mm. Listen, this is so important. Please, please lean in and hear <laughs> this. All right, everybody's heard about turmeric yep. recently. It's Love one of the it. hot things, right? Mm-hmm. Curcumin, yep. right? We got to get the curcumin, <laughs> right? Because of the anti-inflammatory aspects. So the Journal of Biological Chemistry found that curcumin, which is this really powerful active component that's in Mm turmeric, blocks NFKB, which is a molecule that travels into the nuclei of a cell and turns on genes related to inflammation. So this is an epigenetic trigger Mm -hmm. that it blocks, that creates inflammation. By the way, for people who's like, what is NFKB? Mm -hmm. That is... Nuclear factor, kappa light chain enhancer of That's activated right. B cells. You make it sound You're a lot nicer. You're welcome for making it, it smaller. Mm, all right? I'd call it. So NFKB. that's just one. That's just one <laughs> aspect. Now, here's another little fancy thing. Yeah. That uh, I'm gonna enlighten you guys too. This Bring one. It on. I might not want to share this, but I'm gonna share. It. All right. <laughs> and this was a study. It's published in June 2006 in the issue of Life Enhancement. Scientists found out that turmeric. Uh, this active compound curcumin mm-hmm. protected mice, which were kept awake for 72 hours. So they were sleep deprived. <laughs> they protected them. They protected the mice from symptoms of sleep deprivation, such as impaired locomotor activity, memory dysfunction, mm-hmm. weight loss, and even depression. That's amazing. So not just weight loss, but weight disruptions, mm-hmm. because some people gain weight, some people lose weight, depending on how what's going on with their hormones. So they found that this protected them from that. All wow. right. So I see we've why got, you didn't want to tell us that. Right. This isn't saying just go and do Netflix and chill for the next <laughs> right. 72 hours. But if you are in that spot where you know, okay, I'm going to mm-hmm. be under more stress here. I'm going to be having a shorter time to sleep. This can help your body a little bit. This is like those small percentages. This is not something to rely on, but it's something I do have in my superhero utility belt. Mm-hmm. I travel with this. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorite things. And so I'm using the organic supercritical extract of turmeric from Organifi. Got it. And you know that I talk about Organifi for yep. the green superfood blend. And I absolutely love them for that. And everybody should be on the green juice mm-hmm. supplement mm-hmm. that they have. But their daily turmeric as well is something you guys want to check out for sure. for sure. I use this on a daily basis. I just had it today for breakfast. Mm-hmm. And it's just something that everybody needs to have in their in their back pocket for when you need it. Right. But also, but you want to be proactive because, by the way, really exactly. quickly, in the study, they gave it to them beforehand. Right. Before they sleep deprived. <laughs> right. So it's just like, yeah. stay right. ready so you don't have to get ready. I love All that. right. So head That's over to saying. Organifi.com mm-hmm. forward slash model. That's O R G A N I F I.com forward slash M O D E L. Use the checkout code model. And by the way, you'll see the turmeric, the daily turmeric right there as well. Okay. That's the feature. Use the checkout code model, 20% off. See? You're welcome. Because you're in the Because family. I love you. All right. Do. And yeah, on that do. note, let's get to the <laughs> iTunes review of the week. Speaking of love, this is another five-star rating. This says, don't sleep on this one from Ticket T2. I decided that the latter part of last year I was going to take back my health. 
Because I'm a talk radio junkie, I decided to look for specific health topics related to mind, body, and soul. And I found you. Your show is all that and a bag of chips. So informative, and you always break it down so the common person can understand. I listen while I'm at work, and my coworkers tease me about listening to you and a few others. They call it mumbo jumbo. Well, who cares? I'm 54, looking like 34. Mm. Like what you're doing? <laughs> LOL, thank you for all that you do. Oh, and to your co host, thanks for being so awesomely. Signed to Hetty, a new listener. Big hug. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that. That's amazing. That's right. And playing it at work. I'm saying, <laughs> Get I'm, on their nerves. That might be the first time I've been all that in a bag of chips. And a bag of chips. So That's thank you right. for we sharing did. that. And thank you for. <laughs> For being who you are and expressing yeah. all of this great information because that's what we're actually talking mm-hmm. about today. 54 so, looking like 34. On that note, let's get to our special guest and our topic yeah. of the day. Today's guest is Dr. Alyssa Apple, and she is the leading health psychologist who studies stress, aging, and obesity. And she's the director of UCSF's Aging, Metabolism, and Emotion Center and is associate director of the Center for Health and Community. Right. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and serves on scientific advisory committees for the National Institutes of Health and the Mind and Life Institute. She has received awards from Stanford University, the Society of Behavioral Medicine, and the American Psychological Association. And she is the author, co-author of one of the most important books of our time. I truly, truly believe that. And this is called The Telomere Effect. And I'd like to welcome to the Model Health Show, Dr. April, how are you doing today? Great, Sean. Thank you so much for having me, and I love love your enthusiasm about the book. You get you totally get it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's truly, truly been a pleasure. I devoured this book. I've Ooh. been caught with this book in my hands every single uh, available moment over the last couple of weeks, and just very, very excited. I've read it and reread parts of it. It's so important and so profound. But before we get to the book and the content, and I want to know a little bit more about you. Uh, can you share a little bit more of your backstory? You know, what got you interested in health and science in the first place? Mm. Well, I have always been fascinated with the mind-body connection. And I thought that was going to take me to needing to be a doctor and, you know, be helping people uh, one-on-one with their health. And then I realized, you know, it's the relationship that's so interesting there as a uh, as a doctor and the healing aspects and, and helping people with their mind, uh, not just their body. And so that, that after I kind of slogged through a lot of pre-med and, uh, was about to apply to medical school, uh, I realized if I really want to spend decades understanding and, and helping people with a mind body connection, it was trying to, uh, research it for, you know, deeper understanding of how we can get a hold of it in our own personal lives and, and, uh, manipulate it and, and really promote better health in ourselves and our, those around us. So it was just this whole realization that it was research that was going to be the passion for me. And I was doing these studies. I was, I was, a um, I did a lot of things after college. You know, I did temp work. Um, I was a was a research assistant where you do a lot of grunt work, mm. and it's not thrilling. But this is it was the ideas and the um, interviewing people and the you know the the little pieces of daily work that add up to answering big discovery questions about the mind body connection. That I said this is so fascinating. I'm going to have to, you know, stop, um, these applications for medical school and figure out what, what I need to do to do research in the mind body area. So anyway, I went to, uh, um, study health psychology. It was kind of a new field. And, uh, I, you know, one, one of the other things that happened is I was taking these classes in psychology where there were such basic, huge lessons about the power of the mind. Mm. So I took a class on mind control where we were learning, this is with Phil Zimbardo, who's kind of a master of the mind. He did those prison experiments. And we learned about, um, you know, extreme examples of how the mind could affect the body and illness and sudden death and things like that, as well as, uh, 
you know, cults and how, how people can, um, control the mind in good or bad ways. Um, and so anyway, the, that led me to starting to do research in health psychology, which at that time was still in the area of let's understand how stress and, and aspects of our lifestyle can contribute to things like high blood pressure or diseases. And those are interesting questions, but it was more getting even more specific and deeper than that, that, that led me to, to really wanting to understand how the cell ages. Mm. Wow. You've got such an eclectic background and it's really interesting that, you know, when I even read your bio and shared some of the things that you've accomplished, some of the things that you're a part of, I think it's going to be very, um, empowering for people to hear that there's even a center for health and community, yeah. you know, or that there's an, something to do with aging metabolism and emotion center. And mm -hmm. what was it that really, what, what drove you? Is there something from your childhood or something, you know, just in the collegiate experience that got you interested in all of this stuff? Mm. Uh, you know, I had a pretty, um, privileged and well, and, you know, kind of protected childhood. I was completely drawn to, um, trauma and people who had harder lives than I did, mm -hmm. you know, probably cause, cause frankly, cause my, my life growing up in Carmel was pretty boring. Um, mm. and so I was really drawn in, you know, wanting to understand, um, how, how people be, were resilient, how they faced such hard situations and, and thrived. And, um, I, I'm not, you know, it's not, my adult life hasn't been as easy as that. So yeah. I'm not so, um, I'm not so enamored with trauma. It's not a magnet to me anymore, but it, it certainly is a huge factor in our lives. So I think one of the big lessons from this cell aging work is, uh, you know, there's different types of stress that affect cell aging and some, some have tiny unimportant effects and some have big lasting effects. And actually it is the childhood trauma that is one of the more important effects. So we can, we can talk about that. Okay, for uh, sure. We'll like, dive into that uh, as we get into more of the book. Uh, I'm curious, how did you come to collaborate with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn? And why did you guys feel that writing this book was important right now? So that's a good question. So I, I, I was uh, studying effects of stress on uh, parents of children with chronic conditions like autism. And I was in my... Um, postdoc at UCSF. So that's a time when you, you want to look around and say, what's the most interesting thing I could study? You know, wh where's the cutting edge here? And so it, it wasn't, as I said, kind of looking at well, what's going to cause high blood pressure, but really what's going to cause aging and how do we measure aging? And that's still a tough question. There's lots of different paths of aging. We, uh, we know that aging is doesn't map on our biological aging doesn't map onto the, our years of living very well. It's very elastic. And so how can we understand this in a early in life in a way that we can measure in people as their children going through trauma or young adults and not wait till we're over 50 and we start breaking down uh, and we start getting all those, you know, early risk factors, high cholesterol, diseases of aging. Those are just so common after, you know, in our older years. So, so that led me to look around at the different ways we age and how we can measure it. And the telomeres were one of the main exciting areas in understanding cell aging. They hadn't been studied in humans much. And I was just really lucky that the main researcher who studied telomeres, who kind of started the field and helped discover them and the enzyme telomeres was at UCSF. So I had been reading about Liz and her work and uh, really just knocked at her door and said, you know, we have the sample of really high stress women. Mm. We know that it ca can cause depression and, and high blood pressure and maybe even early mortality. What do you think is going on in their telomeres and can we, can we measure that? So that was the beginning. That was, a, you know, about 15 years ago. Oh, wow. That's such a great story. Just mm -hmm. being able to go knock on the door. Right. <laughs> and you've got this incredible body of work and mm -hmm. so does she and to, mm -hmm. to collaborate. That's what you guys are getting with this book and how all of this stuff intersects. 
And so let's talk a little bit about the book. Why why this book right now? I mean, there's it's like a, a it's like the wild wild west in a way. <laughs> you know, just there's so much action sure happening it with it. And, you know, 10 years from now, it's going to be different. But right now, I think it's so important for people to know about this information. And uh, so why why right now for you guys? Mm -hmm. So there, the way that we do science is we find one little thing, we write it up in one study, in one journal. Maybe the public hears about it in a soundbite, maybe not. But there were all these pieces of the puzzle that when put together provided this full story of, wow, this... This particular cell aging system, it's not just about genetics, it's not just about our health behaviors, but it's also about things outside our body, chemicals, yeah. social relationships, neighborhoods. That did it for us. You know, that was that was compelling enough that we thought we really want to tell the full story. And it's gotta be a book so that people can we can read all the different literatures and bring them together rather than uh, you know, just one story about one aspect. Yeah. Yes, yes. So the book is titled The Telomere Effect, and I'd love if you can start with describing, and we've talked about this before on the show, but to hear this from you is, is, is very, very important. Just describe for us what exactly telomeres are, how do they work, and what can they tell us about ourselves? So one way that uh, is a very good metaphor for understanding telomeres is to think of your shoelace. Now, your shoelace has this plastic aglet at the tip, called an aglet. And that protects the ends because the ends get more wear and tear and touch the ground. And uh, we need that to stop those shoelaces from fraying. Now think of your, sh your DNA as your shoelace. Our chromosome strands are made of DNA. That's the genes that make us who we are. And as we, you know, we have these 23 pairs of chromosomes in every cell in our body and at the tips of the chromosomes, they're not, um, they, when our cells divide and we need to, uh, you know, create the new strands of DNA, the problem is that the tips are very fragile and they can break and fuse and mutate. And so they need protection. So they have these caps at the end, the telomeres, they are like the aglets of our genome. So they are these wound up strands of non-coding DNA. So they're not genes, but they're made of DNA. Mm -hmm. And they are, when they're really long, they, they solidly protect those chromosomes better from any damage that could happen to, in the cell. And then when our cells divide, those telomeres, they do shorten and a little bit every time their cells divide over the years. And so we want them to be long and strong and healthy so that our cells can keep dividing through the years. When we get in our older years, we're more likely to have our telomeres uh, be critically short. And when they're too short, then the cell becomes senescent and becomes pro-inflammatory. So that's why we need to maintain these, these telomere strands throughout our life. And it's different than normal biomarkers because we're born with them. We all get a certain length. And and that's a really important factor is how long are they when they're born? turns out that's not just genetics. There's also things about our parents and our mom's pregnancy that's influencing how long our telomeres are when we're born. And then regardless of, of that, however long they are at that point, we can somewhat control that rate of change. We know that even in kids, obesity, uh, exposure to bullying and violence and other traumatic stressors, these accelerate the shortening. Wow. That's very, very enlightening to hear that. Um, you know, there's a lot there already. And just to kind of piggyback on that a little bit, you, when you talk about this cell division, this is a natural process. This is how we continue to, to grow and evolve and renew. Um, but there's something that you guys talk about in the book, obviously, is the Hayflick limit is what we know about and what I was taught mm -hmm. in school. And after that period, once you hit the Hayflick limit, then your cells can no longer divide and they're going to eventually have the apoptosis take place, this program cell death. And yep. that is kind of getting closer to the death of you, you know? And so with this discovery, uh, with the telomeres and being able to actually add a length back on or even stop, stop the process from happening so quickly, because as you just mentioned, there's so many things and we're going to talk about them today that can accelerate that process. Um, but what was discovered is that you can, in essence, prevent this process from happening so rapidly and even 
uh, and even add some length back onto those telomeres, which is crazy. That's what she won the Nobel <laughs> Prize for, a big part of that. And we're, we're, we're not getting into like, well, we kind of are dipping our toe in, talking about immortality, but not really, all right? But what I want you to talk about now, if you could, because that can get into that conversation about how long can we live? How long do you choose to live? Let's talk about disease span versus health span. Ooh. Yep. Yeah. So we can live more and more easily to a hundred. Our kids are going to, a greater percentage of them are going to become centenarians. And, but within this kind of, let's say 60 years old to a hundred, that life can be utterly different depending on our health. We can be living for years with chronic disease and managing that, and that kind of can sap our vitality and lead to depression. Or we can be doing the daily work of good lifestyle maintenance and have a longer health span. And so by longer health span, what we mean is we can live the same number of years, but it's not marred by disease. And we compress diseases of aging to the very end. We're all going to die of something, but it doesn't need to last for 10 or 20 years. Yeah. And so if we can uh, really think about health span as the goal rather than longevity, longevity is uh, it's interesting. So let me give you the quick scoop on that. People who are interested in extreme longevity are going to be disappointed with the telomere effect because that is not, that is, there's nothing that we know of that's going to cause people to live for 110 or 120. Longest lived person was 122. Those are genetic reasons that so far that those people can live so long. So some of us may, a few of us may have that. Most of us don't have those genes for extreme longevity. But what we all have is the potential to be living closer in a healthy way to 90 or 100. And that is feasible and within our reach if we can manage all of the parts that we can control. Some of it we can't control, some of the genetic reasons. Those usually kill us much younger than older if it's a genetically caused uh, cause of death. But what is so beautiful is that our daily behaviors are contributing to our health span. And we can see that with these telomere studies. We see that lifestyle is shaping the rate of telomere change over just one year. Mm. And, and then there's some intense interventions where we see shorter time of term effects. But for example, let me give you an example. My uh, study by my colleague, um, Eli Putterman. So we, we examine these really healthy women. They're all postmenopausal, so they're really caring about their health. They're starting. You don't really care about your health until you start to notice that things don't feel good in your body, right? That's mm. when you start to say, hmm, you know, aging, uh, you, you notice age. But before that, uh, I think people are just less motivated to think of the, the daily health behaviors. But these were women after 50 years old, they're starting to notice their aging in these different ways. And they joined our study. They got to learn their telomeres. We measured them at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, and we measured their health behaviors throughout. How well were they eating, their sleep, their exercise? And what we found was that the women who had a lot of um, – severely stressful events that year had greater rate of telomere shortening. It wasn't too surprising to us because we've seen this so much kind of cross-sectionally. But what was important here was that those who were having a healthier lifestyle, they were eating more fruits and vegetables, they were getting sufficient sleep, they were doing more vigorous activity, they didn't show the effect. Their telomeres didn't shorten nearly as much, it, even if they were under this high stress. If they're having a bad year, their telomeres were protected by the exercise and the other things. That's so, yeah. Yeah. That's really, so like, there you go. <laughs> that's a great uh, affirmation and a great reminder to us because we're all going to be hit with stressors, you know? And what's so interesting is that this time when I'm reading this book is like, I I'm, I'm right now dealing with the stressor, like a really kind of out of left field kind of thing. And to be able to look and analyze how I perceive stress and to see you lay it out like the way that I see things is a challenge versus a threat. Um, so let's actually, let's go ahead and talk about that since we're into this area right now. Um, because how we respond to the stress determines so much with what's going to happen with our telomeres. So let's talk about that. So this 
area of research kind of starts in these little lab studies and we can examine how people respond to like giving a speech in front of an unfriendly audience and you can measure people's response and we have all sorts of thoughts and feelings but to simplify things some of us fall on this side of feeling really threatened we feel uh, anxious fearful embarrassed ashamed or e- ego threat we we worry how we look to others um, and that those feelings and thoughts can spike and exaggerate our biological stress response, our cortisol, our stress hormone cortisol, and our inflammatory response, like our cytokine IL-6. And so the threat response, those feelings that we are at tremendous risk and our hearts rate, you know, really racing and we feel um, fearful or embarrassed or ashamed, those are the thoughts and feelings that exaggerate the physical stress response. Yeah. The cortisol, stress hormones, the inflammation, we need that acute response if we're wounded. But we don't need it if it's just the psychological threat. So yeah. there's another type of response where uh, people might feel uh, pumped up, energized by the stress response, hopeful, enthusiastic, thinking I'm going to do well. And uh, this is, there's something to gain here. That's called the challenge response or the positive stress response. And so when we characterize these two different responses, we see different blood flow in our body and, uh, and it relates to the cell aging system. So the people who have the more threat response tend to have shorter telomeres than um, people who have more of the challenge response. And so this is cool because we can actually modulate or um, soften that threat response. And there's many different ways to do that. We talk about them in the book. There's the easiest, lowest hanging fruit to people is these mind-body practices, like learning mindfulness or doing some mind-body practice every day. It really does turn down the volume on that threat response. Um, And then there's some kind of tricks of the mind or exercises that we talk about uh, that are other ways for people who really just never going to like meditation, don't want to sit still, um, they can try these more frame, psychological reframing techniques. So let me give you an example of one. Yeah. My colleague at UCSF, Wendy Mendez, has done these amazing studies, just changing people's threat and challenge responses mm-hmm. and seeing how it affects them. Physio- so she's taken um, college students who are about to take the GREs. So they're really got a lot wrapped up in how they do on these tests, determines if they can, you know, if they can go to grad school or what grad school. And so she teaches that, you know, test anxiety is super important. Some people feel that heart racing, they can't think as well. It just makes them do worse on the test. And so she takes this big group of students and she tells half of them, when you start feeling that stress response before the test, I want you to reframe it and think about that's actually energizing your body. That's going to help you do well. And, and so they're reframing the stress response as positive or in this kind of challenge way that changes everything that changes how their, their blood flows. Their actually heart is more efficient They have more cardiac output. And their um, and the bottom line is, did it change how they do? Did it change their performance on that test? And so she found in the lab, it, they did better. And in real life, they did better. So fascinating. Right. And what's, this will help let, me do better. Let me tell right. you guys, the amount of studies in here, I was blown away <laughs> that so many researchers over, all over the world mm-hmm. have been looking at the impact that so many different things have on our telomeres mm-hmm. and how we mm-hmm. age. And so one of the techniques you, that you talk about here in the book uh, that I think is so valuable and so simple is a cognitive diffusion technique. And it's something to do with distancing. Um, and just to give a little example, you know, a lot of times when we have a, a tough situation happen, a negative situation, a big part of our stress is going back and replaying that thing over and over and over again, right? We put that uh, we put that CD on repeat mm-hmm. and we hate mm-hmm. that song, mm-hmm. right? And 
what we can do to immediately kind of detach from that and to create a, more of a sense of, because what we're doing, we're looking for, maybe there's something in there, or some kind of thing I could have done differently, but you literally can't go back and change the past. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some value to doing some of that for learning purposes, but there's no need to keep going back and living there because you don't live there. Mm -hmm. So distancing, that's basically, in the, just to kind of um, summarize it here, and that, that memory that you're playing back in your mind, now actually take it because when you're playing that in your mind, you're in it, right? Take it and put it up on a movie screen and watch yourself in that situation, you know? So maybe it's Jade and she had a tough day with something, you know, with the kids with school, oh, yeah. right? And you're like, yes. That egg, I've like seen that movie. Hug. Yeah, Groundhog Day for that one. <laughs> and instead of you <laughs> being in it and feeling the emotional jarring mm -hmm. of it, you sit back and you play it on the screen and you see yourself and you're like, oh, okay, I see there where I, uh, you know, uh, should have said this to the kids. Oh, look at Jade. She's probably feeling pretty sad right now, but she's going to be okay. You know, create some distance like between your ego right. and reality. So right? come out of the immersion yeah. of it. And then be a spectator of it. Right. You I can like become that. much more um, analytical mm -hmm. from a healthier perspective. And you can see more of a, a global perspective, right. you right. know, and not just that kind of uh, very minute, just as like mm -hmm. my little life, my little thing. And you can see it and have more compassion. You right. guys talk about this in the book, right. too. I'd love for you to talk more about this, but more self-compassion, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that kindness that we would extend to another human being that we exactly. don't often extend to ourselves. I thought that was so more fascinating. Answers too, make the answers clearer, the yeah. things I'm trying to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So some of us just suffer more from self-critical thoughts. You know who you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes it's childhood influences, parents or other people, you know, voices that get played. And uh, we call this like the... Um, you know, let's just say inner assistant. We have this um, voice and uh, it can be torturing us. It can be telling us negative things about how badly we did, how we failed. Um, it just depends. Listen in and what, you know, what are your thoughts telling you? So for people who have this uh, inner assistant who is, is really kind of torturing them and making them feel bad about themselves, um, there are different ways to deal with that with that voice. So one way is you reframe them as this is the helpful assistant. This voice is just trying to help you. Mm -hmm. And uh, my colleague Dara Westrup has different ways from ACT therapy of reframing that voice. And actually, number one, notice it. No notice all these messages you're giving yourself. Um, and then you can just actually realize that thoughts are just thoughts. Don't believe all your thoughts. Mm. And that's a huge shift for some people. Cause yeah. like, um, uh, like you just said, we're immersed in our own, you know, thoughts and reality. And that's all we can see and think of unless we can take some objective perspective and space and do some distancing. And then we can say, Oh, listen to that voice and laugh at that, mm -hmm. that inner critic or yeah. that help and say, that's my helpful assistant. Um, she's just trying to help. <laughs> uh. And so these self-compassion exercises have really helped people. They're um, uh, from different traditions. The one that I talk about in the book, pioneered by Christine Neff, gives you this really quick, short self-compassion break. And so it leads you through some steps to actually um, notice the, you know, when you're feeling pain in the moment to really give yourself a self-compassion break. You put your hands on your heart and you say certain things to yourself, remind yourself that this is human nature. All people feel this way at different times. There's a common suffering of humanity and that you, you can say things to yourself such as, I'm doing the best I can. Mm. Can I, you know, give, uh, be kind to myself in this moment? And there, there's, you know, there are a list of things. You say what feels right to you. Some people are very... Um, uh, self-critical and they can't stand to think of saying this to themselves. Find the thought that works for you. Mm -hmm. Try it. Love Here's it. Here's one. Send your helpful assistant on a coffee run. <laughs> so, you know what? I appreciate hey. your help. Could you give me a few minutes Doesn't here? my coffee cup look a little low? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you should go grab some. Yeah, yeah. I love Come that. back in a few. You know, a big reason why we can get caught, all of this, this happens to all of us, but some people uh, mm -hmm. can it can be a little bit more chronic is the best word for it. And some people get over things really quickly, but why we 
uh, engage with it so deeply is because of we, we feel it. Mm. You know, this is a it's this interaction with our hypothalamus where our endocrine system and our nervous system are coming together and it's sending this data throughout our body and we feel that depression or we feel that sadness or we feel that uh, we, we it makes us it's very in our bodies. Yeah. So, but the thing is, it's not real. Okay. You know, generally, and that's after you're ruminating on this thing or going over something in the past. It's no longer real, mm. but it's because we're carrying the feeling. And okay. as soon as you can create some distance between that or use one of the techniques that are in this book and that she's already talked about, it's powerful what can happen. Right. And so we all have this capability to take more control over what's happening within our own bodies. And it really starts with you being aware that you can. Right. And that's what's so empowering about this in this moment. So Certainly we're going to talk more that. about uh, telomeres, the impact they have on things like bone loss, heart disease, and something that they refer to as inflammaging, <laughs> inflammaging, uh-huh. coming up right after this break. So hold on. We'll be right back. Massive research is now pouring in with this blossoming field of science and nutrition called nutrigenomics. And this field is studying how every single molecule of food that you eat impacts your genetic expression. So we're literally talking about how your body appears, your health, or lack thereof. All of this is going to be determined by every single molecule of food that you eat. So whether it's a banana or a donut or a hot pocket, whatever it might be, we have to be in tune with the fact that this is going to impact what genes are getting expressed. And there are genes like the FTO gene, for example, that has been found to be this, quote, fat gene and have a high propensity towards obesity if you carry this gene. Now, you can silence these genes by making sure that you're eating real foods that are in alignment with your own genetic integrity. The basis of that needs to be from earth-grown nutrients, things that your body actually recognizes as real food that you have a history with, that your ancestors have a history with, not things that have been invented in the laboratory like last week, all right? So we want to make sure that we're eating real food that are from earth-grown nutrients. And this is why I love on it so much. This is why they are family. This is why I endorse them so powerfully because they are part of my life. They're a part of my family's life. And I want to make sure that you head over to onit.com forward slash model. That's O-N-N-I-T dot com forward slash model. And you're going to get 10% off all of their health and human performance supplements. I'm a huge fan of the Hemp Force Protein I've been using it for many years. It's one of my favorite things in the world, and I give this to my kids as well. And this is one of the things that I love to have post-workout. Now, hemp is based on some powerful uh, amino acids, some powerful protein building blocks like albumin, which is a very soft globular protein that's very easy to digest, plus edestin. And this is a unique protein compound that's found in hemp that might be the most bioavailable, usable protein for the human body. Crazy, right? So a lot of people today are hearing about the benefits of hemp, hemp seeds and hemp protein and and hemp oil, things like that. We want to make sure, again, that you're getting organic and that it's made with integrity, right? So that this cold process, so that you're actually able to get the nutrients that you're looking for in this kind of protein powder, protein cake that you're getting with Hemp Force Protein from Onnit. They've got multiple flavors. They've got the Chaco Maca. They've got the Vanilla Acai. And they also have a brand new recovery protein that adds in the powerful component of colostrum, which has every single amino acid, every polysaccharide, aka essential sugar, and every essential fatty acid right there in it. These powerful building blocks, growth factors, every growth factor that influences your body's metabolism is there in that protein, uh, the recovery protein. So make sure that you're checking that out as well. Super powerful stuff. Also has immune factors to help uh, fortify your immune system. Just great stuff. And they've got exercise equipment, tons of great foods, Head over, check them out today, onit.com forward slash model, O-N-N-I-T dot com forward slash M-O-D-E-L for 10% off. Now back to the show. And we are back. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We're talking about the telomere effect. Yes. This phenomenal book right here in my hands. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I truly do feel this is one of the most important books of our time. And I've read a lot of books and we've done a lot of shows. I've spoken at a lot of events. I've uh, reached a lot of people. And for me to say that, I really do mean this. And we're talking with uh, Dr. Alyssa uh, Eppel and we are diving in and (laughs) and really breaking down all of these interesting things that's going on with our, literally our biological Mm -hmm. aging. And so before the break, I mentioned how our telomeres have an impact on things like bone loss, 
heart disease and something you guys called inflam aging. So mm-hmm. let's talk a little bit about that. Word blend. Yeah. Okay. So how do cells age? What happens when we get these old age cells? In most of the tissues we've studied, the, the fibroblasts, the immune cells, the bone cells, this aging program, when it changes in the cell and the cell becomes old and senescent, it starts to create pro-inflammatory cytokines, even in the fat cells. And so we, in our blood, get this slow buildup of inflammation from different sources in our body, from the immune cells, from the fat cells. And that is really a huge highway of aging. This is this inflammation creates uh, a lot of disease processes that we know about. It contributes to heart disease. Uh, it makes the tissue really fertile ground for cancers to develop. So we've got to be thinking about how can we reduce our inflammation. And the good news is most of the things we do uh, can increase it, bad diet, bad sleep, stress. And so most of these health behaviors that we've been talking about can kind of clamp down and and reduce inflammation. Love it. You even talk about... um gray hair, how skin changes, and how telomeres are involved in all of those things in depth here in the book. And specifically, bone loss is important to me when we talk about the the osteoblast cells and things like that. These all have the same kind of cellular makeup where we're talking about telomeres and how quickly you're going to break down, basically. And for me, and, and I know you don't know this story yet, but when I was 20 years old, I was diagnosed with a degenerative bone disease where I was, my physician at the time's told me that I had the spine of an 80-year-old person. How is that possible when you're 20? And what happened was I literally accelerated my aging process because of my lifestyle. And it's like, how how hard do you have to try yeah. to get that old that fast? And the thing was, I was doing going. so good. I was so good at eating Cheetos. I was so good at it. <laughs> like Krispy Kremes. Yeah. Um, and this is mm. real talk. I, I literally didn't eat a salad until I was in my 20s, my entire mm. life. Mm. The sleep deprivation, the lack of movement, you know, mm. and uh, the also what we've already been covering today, my worldview. Mm. My worldview and being so self-centered and so caught Mm -hmm. within myself Mm -hmm. that those things debilitated me. And what's proof in this whole thing and why I think this book is so important is that I was able to literally regenerate those tissues. I was literally able to turn back the Mm -hmm. clock and to regain the health of a person of my age. You know, how is that even possible? Because the situation is so-called incurable. Mm -hmm. That's just not true. It's just... We don't know at the time. Now we know. Now we know what some of the underlying mechanisms are. And so excited to share that. And don't forget about your environment, Sean. That played a part. And I heard uh, Dr. Apple mention that a little bit earlier, that those things affect telomere length. So that was playing a role for you at the time. And then the high level of exercise, there was a lot of stress going on. And you were just getting started. (laughs) <laughs> so true. Yeah. Uh, I, I that is an amazing amazing story Sean and just looking at you like right. you couldn't be a better example of the hope we should have we that mm. we can turn things around and completely change our our body our tissues are dividing and making new ones where um there's this iterative process of what we're made of over time. Um you are living proof. You look like you're thriving. Yeah. Thank you yeah. oh, so much. Thank you so much. And now, it's pouring from his cells. It's contagious. Nice. <laughs> my, my cup doth overflow. <laughs> All right. So let's talk some, about some of the tips specifically to help support our telomere function as related to stress. As you mentioned, uh, there's specific things with our nutrition. So let's actually, let's just go ahead and start there. Let's talk about right. food in that context. All right. So food is so such a th- you know, such a thorny topic. And there's so many different opinions. Um, I do tend to come to, I'm part of the camp of calories, not just a calorie, that not all calories are equal, that we shouldn't be thinking and worrying about calories. We should be eating, you know, the, the whole food diet, right? So foods that are high fiber, that are fresh, uh, vegetables and fruits and not worry about fats and really, um, Think about uh, the refined sugars in the meat. So the telomere studies 
they certainly confirm what we know. They are longer in people who eat this whole food diet, the Mediterranean diet, um, the, you know, in a, lots of Asian studies showing a prudent diet, very similar to the Mediterranean diet. But this is, this is a diet that's low in refined sugars and low in meat. And so when we look at the break it down and say, well, what specific foods kind of pop out as being related to longer telomeres? The, there are some really consistent findings and there are some new findings. So the consistent findings are omega-3 fatty acids, mm -hmm. seaweed, fish, um, those kind of nuts and seeds and legumes. There are ways to get omegas besides the fish. I personally do the algae. The fish have high omega-3s because they eat the algae. Yeah. We don't need to eat the fish. We can directly eat the algae and leave, you know, the fish in the sea. <laughs> so I'm a vegetarian, so I have my biases. Um, so the other things that pop out in terms of what we drink, tea, green tea. We already know green tea is more antioxidants than black tea. So there's one study that three cups a day of green tea was associated with longer telomeres. Uh, that was from Asia. What about coffee? I've been waiting for someone to study coffee. I've been holding my breath on that one. Um, and there's now been a large study associating coffee, caffeinated coffee, to longer telomeres. Phew. So that's good news for... <laughs> Would you I'm look at you that? There. Would you look at that? Oh, my goodness. Look like that's it. <laughs> It's... First of all, with everything that she said, and this is imbued into what she talks about in the book as well, quality matters a lot. You know, even the quality of coffee that you're drinking, mm -hmm. you know, instead of stuff that's like roasted toasted with uh, <laughs> pesticides included in it you know um it's going to be a little bit different totally. so make sure that we're getting high quality mm -hmm. of all these things and so here one of the things in the book and i'm just going to read directly says people with higher blood levels of omega-3 fatty acids dha uh and epa have slower attrition over time those who ate half serving of seaweed each day had longer telomeres later in life hello All right, mcfly hello <laughs> eat Sea veggies, the dulse, <laughs> dulse, wakame, mm -hmm. nori, mm -hmm. uh, kelp, yeah. right? There's so many different ones to choose from. These yeah. things are loaded with valuable, like the polysaccharides, the amino acids. There's even some rare kind of um, uh, small amounts of these essential fats as well. But when you talk about the omega-3s as well, you talk about uh, specifically they're associated with an increase in telomere length. And you've got studies to back this up. So when we hear about you should be having some more omega-3s, it's not just airy-fairy talk. This is a real thing. And you do mention, of course, fish oil. It's not necessarily sustainable. It's a source for sure. Uh, eating the whole fish themselves. Algae oil. So there's krill oil. I'm a big fan of marine phytoplankton okay. is another thing. <laughs> then they've got mm. like, um, uh, um, the, all the different types of uh, algaes that are out there as well have some unique fats in there. So like mm -hmm. the spirulinas, the uh, AFA as well, blue-green algae. Mm -hmm. So there's lots and lots yeah. of sources. The important thing is that you take action and utilize them on a consistent basis. So on that note, let's go ahead and move on towards sleep. What? Yes. Sleep what? actually <laughs> does impact our telomere length. What and a how, and how right. long we live. I've been waiting for you to mention sleep, Sean. I, I, we all, we need to learn from you here. So the, the sleep literature, we know most of us don't get enough sleep. And we also know that quality of sleep yeah. is really important. And it turns out to be really important for telomeres. So what, what is quality? All we know as researchers is we, you know, some people say they sleep poor or not so well um, or good. And then some people say their sleep quality is excellent. Uh, how do we get toward excellent? Yes, yes. So I love this because earlier you said how you were definitely in the camp of understanding that calorie is not just a calorie, the quality of those calories. So the same thing with sleep minutes, yep. right? Yes. Some hey, people, Sean. it's just like a Twinkie, right? There's people, you can eat 300 calories of Twinkies or yep. 300 calories of broccoli. It's going to impact your body very differently. Mm -hmm. You know, the calories are not yeah. the same. Same thing with our sleep. You can get uh, eight hours of Twinkie sleep <laughs> or eight hours of high quality sleep and Nutrious it can revolutionize sleep. your health. Yes. When, when we're talking about quality, we're talking about what's going on with your sleep cycles. Mm -hmm. And that really boils down to what's going on with your brain and your endocrine system. All right. Being able to cycle through from uh, the beta normal waking state we're all in to the alpha, theta, delta, and to gracefully 
traverse those places to get your body because there's rebuilding factors in all of those stages that you need in segments that your body has evolved to know how to do. All right. Mm. If you've made it here to the planet, you know how to sleep. All right. <laughs> but we create bad habits that throw off that quality, throw mm -hmm. off those rhythms, throw off our sleep cycle. One of those big things is, and since we just touched on this, I'm going to talk about nutrition deficiencies. No, okay. There's certain nutrition deficiencies that block certain sleep related hormones or neurotransmitters from being created. You know, certain lifestyle practices that we can employ as well. You know, so if you're eating processed foods, that's going to zap your body. It's going to literally leach out important minerals that are related to sleep, like calcium, yep. like magnesium mm. specifically. Magnesium is responsible for 300 biochemical processes that we know about, and it's an anti-stress mineral that really helps to open up that sleep pathway. It's why yeah. people know about Epsom salts, mm -hmm. one of the classic mm -hmm. things for relaxation, for helping to soothe and kind of heal sore muscles, that kind of thing. That's uh, magnesium sulfate, just a form of magnesium. So we need to make sure that we're guarding and making sure we're getting these key sleep nutrients that I talk about in my book. And also adding in, you guys talked about the mega threes. That's one of them, funny enough, you know, so making sure that we're squared away there. And lastly, and you know, we talked about this a ton on the show, but something that's very pervasive in our culture today that's interrupting our sleep quality is our relationship with our devices, yep. you know, and Harvard researchers have confirmed this, that basically every hour you're on your device at night, not during the day, didn't have an impact, but at night, every hour you're on your device, it suppresses melatonin for about 30 minutes. Oh boy. All right. So even though you might physiologically be yeah. passed out, you know, like you're unconscious, you might not be cycling through. You likely aren't cycling mm -hmm. through your normal sleep cycles because melatonin is not being uh, produced in its right, right, uh, right amount. Right. There's right? the Twinkie sleep. So how do we guard mm. against that? Really quick, three quick tips. Number one, have a screen curfew. I recommend give yourself at least mm. just a solid like 30 minutes at least. Come on, <laughs> right. you can get 30 minutes. Yeah, we get 30. <laughs> All right, uh, an hour is better, but yeah. fill that with something that's of equal or greater value. That's the key. You can't just sit there and twiddle your thumbs. You know, read a good book like the Telomere Effect. Mm -hmm. All right, um, engage in some, um, uh, some family time. Like this is a time really been playing Connect Four with my five-year-old. <laughs> he's freaking Bobby Fisher with the <laughs> Connect Four, man. He's People come in the house, he's like, hey, I want to play, he's so cute. And they just he just terrorizes them, right? <laughs> and so, um, but some family time, some game time, hanging out. Uh, sex yes. is a good opportunity here if you have a significant other. Um, uh, and of course, we talk about the relationship between sleep and sex. There's a lot of healthy aspects there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so fill that time with something that you actually are excited about. Don't just twiddle your thumbs. And all, lastly, uh, screen protection. So flux, F dot L U X for your laptop desktops mm -hmm. to pull out that troublesome spectrum of light that suppresses melatonin the most. Uh, we've got blue light blocking glasses. You can wear all kinds of cool stuff like that apps on your phone. So that's what I would have to say about that. And I'm so excited. Like your book, so many layers mm -hmm. of greatness in here, mm -hmm. bringing this and tying it into the fold. So last thing I want to talk about with that is the exercise component. Um, because mm -hmm. a lot of people that listen to the show are very adamant about their exercise. Some people are just getting started. What do we need to do as far as exercise to keep us younger longer? So the question is, what's the right amount and what's too much? And, you know, we don't we don't have all I can tell you the view from the telomere. And of course, um, there is there are other ways exercise benefits us. But from the view of the telomere, we don't actually, it's not that more is always better in terms of like ultra marathons and marathon runners. They do tend to have long telomeres, but people who like, let's say run a moderate amount three times a week also have longer telomeres. So uh, moderate exercise. Um, in one study, we looked at high stress people and how much exercise uh, was needed to buffer the telomere shortening. So the people who were sedentary and high stress tended to have shorter telomeres. People who were exercising at least 10 minutes a day of getting a sweat up uh, didn't show that shortening. Mm. So we think that, I mean, that's just an observational study, but we think that uh, little bits of little bits matter and add up. And we know that sedentary behavior is related to shorter telomeres. So they both matter. You know, how much are you sitting still and how much are you getting your heart rate up and, and being vigorous? And we need to really get a good balance there. Um, so uh, there have been some try. there's just emerging trials to really show this stuff in a more uh, causal way. And it looks like interval training. So um, 
walking right. briskly and intensely and then stopping and resting and then doing it again. We write about that in the book. That actually looks just as good as the endurance training. Ah, I love that. We've got some episodes coming out soon about that. Uh, more and more, because this is something I've been advocating for almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. But now to have uh, connections with amazing people like yourself and the people who are actually doing the studies that are in the lab, putting people on these stationary bikes and having them pedal like crazy and monitoring what's happening with their with their blood, with their with their telomeres, with their mm -hmm. um, with their stress hormones, all this stuff. And to have that data so profound and so exciting. So, guys, you heard it here um, mm -hmm. really with the sedentary lifestyle, we all, we've heard all the different things about it, but please understand, you just said it, like if you're sitting still, you're actually aging faster. It's crazy, right? right. If you're still, and factor the in world stress. is, time is still going and yep. actually you're running on that. Faster. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you jumped mm. on the time treadmill, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like yeah. you sitting there yeah. on a, on a, um, what is that thing at the airport where it's moving? The little tram thing. Mm -hmm. Is it a tram? Monor yeah. It's a, it's a human tram, walking tram. <laughs> That's what it I makes call you it. feel like a superhero yeah. for a second. Yeah. Hop on there. <laughs> and then yeah. you get off and you're like, oh, man, yeah. uh -huh. not good uh -huh. enough yet. So this is so <laughs> awesome. And there's so many different aspects that I want to talk to you about still. And uh, I'm have very excited for you. Of course. Yeah, we absolutely yeah. have to yeah. do another show. Uh, but there's so much great information here in the book. Can you please let everybody know where they can find your book and where they can connect with you online? Thanks. So I'm going to give you two websites. So the book website is www.telomereeffect.com. Telomere is T-E-L-O-M-E-R-E -E effect, E-F-F-E-C-T. And I'm also going to give you um, my lab uh, website. We are... Uh, starting to um, put some of the tests, the personal assessments on our lab website for people. Some of them are, can't be public and um, some of them are only in the book, but some we could put on the web. Some colleagues, you know, allowed us to, who actually own their scales. So basically it's step one in that awareness you were talking about. What's my stress tendency? How hostile am I? How pessimistic am I? Um, so my lab website is uh, www a M E center one word dot UCSF dot edu. <laughs> Just you know, type in uh, a the the A M E and UCSF, and you will find my lab site. A M E stands for Aging Metabolism Emotions. A M E UCSF. Find me. Go to Telomere Effect on my website. Take some tests. Email me. Tell me if it's helpful. It's all one big experiment. Life's one big experiment. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so wonderful. <laughs> and we'll put all of that in the show notes, of course, for this episode. So you can just head to themodelhealthshow.com and you'll find all of those links. And I've got one final question for you before I let you go today, even though I don't want to. Mm -hmm. um, what, <laughs> what is the model that you're here to set with the way that you're living your life personally? I am like most of your listeners and I do my best in my different roles, uh, you know, as parent, uh, as um, at work, to be good to my people, um, as a friend. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, I think my motto is you just do your best. You know, we, we don't strive to like be a, I, I set reasonable goals, so I'm not disappointed with myself. Um, I think you'll notice nothing in our book is an extreme yeah. at anything. And, you know, that's what we found from all these huge population studies, the little things we do matter. Um, I personally really uh, value and at this point need my own, uh, you know, positive habit. And that is different types of yoga. Some are more meditative than others. Um, and when I don't do that, I feel bad. So I've, you know, I fortunately developed it as a positive addiction at this point so that I, even if I can't get to a class, I'm doing it for you know, five or 10 minutes when I wake up. Um, and it does set our trajectory. You know, I think that those morning, little bit of morning uh, minutes when we wake up can really set our trajectory for the day. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, I just want to say thank you so much for you know, the path that you've taken. And it's absolutely, for me, it's so refreshing to to know that there's someone like yourself out there doing this work and looking at how, we perceive reality, how that's impacting our health and how important that is in teaching people 
how to to get on top of that and how to be empowered in mm-hmm. that. So I just want to say thank you so much for being you and for taking action to write this book. Thank you so much, Sean. It's such a pleasure to to meet you and learn from you too. It's my <laughs> pleasure. The pleasure is all mine. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show today. I am just I'm myself personally blown away by this book, blown away, blown away by this work. And I'm eternally grateful to be able to share this with you. And I hope that you got a lot of value out of this. This information is thing. These are things that are going to stay with you for a lifetime. Yes. And the, the health span of that <laughs> of that lifetime yeah. really depends on these small things, the things that we've been talking about on this show for years, you know, and to have so much more uh, information, so much more research to come out affirming that it's these small things. It doesn't take anything like dramatic that's just over the top for you to have the health and the body and the life that you truly deserve. It's the small things and taking action. Uh, but a big piece that I want you guys to really understand and what's highlighted in this book is that, you know, we we all are going to have times of tremendous stress. You know, it's a part of life. But uh, many of these things are hermetic stressors. You know, you've heard the saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's tr- true for many things. Now, there are situations where the stress is chronic. That's where the problem is. That's where the life defeating and the shortening shortening of our health span, the lo- lengthening of our disease span takes place. And that's what I want to guard you from. And she specifically in the book talks about um, caregivers, you know, people who have um, b- been put in that position or are selected that position to care for the well-being of others who are in, in very tough, tough times or in, in a tough way, with, whether it's with their health mm-hmm. or whatever the case might be, and how emotionally tied in we all are as human beings. And it's so beautiful. But there are things that we need to do that you need to be doing. You know, the mothers and fathers listening, the, the, the uncles and, 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 and aunts, the brothers and sisters who are helping uh, the people in our community, the people in our family. You have to step up and take on these mindset shifts so that you are seeing it as a challenge that you are going to overcome with grace and with mm. power yeah. versus you mm. seeing it as something that you don't think that you have what it takes. And it's going to tear you down every single day until you're no longer here. And I've seen it happen. Yeah. I've seen it happen on both First ends hand. of the spectrum. Yeah. And this is your opportunity to do something about it and to really step into your greatness. And I appreciate you so much for tuning into the show today. Take care. Have an amazing day. And I'll talk with you soon.